Nazywam się Dominika. Od dwóch lat pracuję jako motornicza. Nazywam się Ryszard Majchrowski. Prowadzę piekarnię w Gdańsku. Przejąłem ją po ojcu i samodzielnie prowadzę od 1982 roku. Nazywam się Kuba i przygotowuję projekt studenci uczniom. Nazywam się Ewa Patyk i wspieram mieszkańców w domu sąsiedzkim gościnna przystań na Orli. Nazywam się Katarzyna Kałduńska, od 10 lat pracuję w Pomorskim Hospicjum dla Dzieci jako pielęgniarka. Welcome everyone, ladies and gentlemen, to European Solidarity Center on our first, first film festival, your All About Freedom Festival. This year, unfortunately, due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, our festival is taking entire uh, taking place entirely in an online format. Um, and I'm welcoming you to take a look on all the films that are in the program. And here uh, I would like to welcome my guest today, uh, Mr. David Franz, who is the director of uh, one of the films in um, this year's program, which is Welcome to Chechnya. David is a New York-based director and Oscar-nominated filmmaker, New York Times uh, best-selling author and award-winning investigative journalist. And as I mentioned, uh, we're here today to, um, to discuss um, his film, Welcome to Chechnya, and my name is Kasper Jekan, I'm from European Solidarity um, Center. David, thank you very much for agreeing to, um, to talk to us and to provide some insight on the um, background of this uh, extremely um, interesting and uh, scary as well um, documentary that you, um, that you filmed. Um, I would like to ask you to share with us some, uh, some details on the uh, production of this film because I can only imagine how, how difficult it was. I've read that you came to, to Chechnya in, this in disguise as a wealthy uh, football slash soccer fan who, who was following an Egyptian uh, national team during the World Cup in 2018 and this, uh, this allowed you to, um, to get into Chechnya without uh, getting recognized as a, as a filmmaker. Could you share uh, something about this? True, and thanks for having me. I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, uh, Chechnya is a very closed part of Russia. It's isolated geographically, it's isolated culturally, it has its own language. Uh, it's not a place where uh, many people travel for tourism, uh, in, including many uh, Russians themselves. Um, so I knew just my presence would cause some form of alarm to go off. And um, uh, so I, I, and I was traveling with um, activists who were also undercover, who were there to rescue a young woman um, whose life was in danger. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to create a, a record of this. I wanted to record this to document the work that they were doing without, in a way that would not... Um, uh, expose them uh, that would not blow the cover of the operation itself. Um, and uh, I did this, I, I brought along a, a, a cinematographer with me. Uh, she was shooting uh, with a hidden GoPro and I was filming with my camera. And um, my cover story was that um, I was, a, as you said, a, a, just a wild fan of the Egyptian team that had just traveled through um, Chechnya as part of the World Cup. Uh, that year, um, and uh, and I was using a phone to take tourism uh, pictures and videos, uh, and um, uh, and that's what I wanted to look like, and not somebody who was at all connected with the operations that I happened to be standing next to, um, and uh, and and that was probably the most complicated of the cover stories that we developed. Um, uh, 
in most instances, the cover stories were not needed. But in this one, I was actually detained on the way out of the region after we had already picked up the young woman, Anya. I was in a separate car uh, and uh, stopped at a at an informal checkpoint that exists all around the, the Republic. Um, and when I produced an American passport, it was quite a surprise to the people who had stopped us. Um, and so I was brought in for questioning. And, um, uh, and that's where I unfolded my cover story. And <clears throat> uh, I had two telephones. One I was using to shoot the, the film with, and the other was my tourism phone, my, my cover story phone. And I brought that with me to the detention and showed them all the photographs I had taken. And, um, and, and literally, I had filled it with uh, you know, every bit of ephemera that a, that a wild, um, off-the-beaten-path tourist might have filmed. Um, and it worked, so my detention didn't last more than 10 or 15 minutes, and, uh, and I was sent quite, quite sternly on my way to continue my, my exit from the region. Um, thank you very much. Uh, in the film, at certain moments, you also follow um, your protagonists, among others, at um, Russian airports. And I was wondering also, was it difficult to keep the, the cover or basically to, to keep filming in such uh, places where full, filled with um, authorities um, where it could have been um, either alarming or just, just difficult to, to continue doing it? Uh, how did you manage to, to do all those things? You know, the film takes place both indoors and outdoors. Our indoor filming um, in, in, within the shelter system, um, that was done with a, um, a, a small tourist um, handicam. But when we went outside, we always used uh, hidden cameras um, because uh, we did not want to draw the kind of attention I was talking about before. Um, and, uh, and, and if we failed, if we were discovered, if the mission uh, were revealed, then people's lives were... Uh, hanging in the balance. Um, uh, we knew that very profoundly and it really motivated every step that we took. When, when we were in the airports, it's not legal in Russia to, to film in airports. So we again used hidden cameras for the most part. Um, and also for the most part, we, we had um, a, a, a curtain of uh, deniability between us and the action that was happening. For example, in the airports, the principal shooting is done by um, uh, a team of uh, cinematographers who arrived well earlier than we did, um, never greeted us, uh, stood at a great distance and shot with telephoto lenses on with using hidden cameras and body cameras, um, GoPros where appropriate. Um, and once again, uh, I was there shooting on my cell phone. Um, Again, as a tourist, um, who uh, my, had I been caught, um, I would have denied any knowledge about the rules about filming in the airport. I would have been able to delete what I was shooting. I was the secondary and tertiary camera, um, and uh, and also, I, you know, I did not show up uh, in in the party uh, that included the activists and the the survivors um, in any way. So. It was all done um, with communication beforehand and afterward, but, um, but we kept uh, a serious barriers between us. Yes, I can tell that you took uh, very serious precautions and um, all of the um, possible solutions to avoid um, the risk because, of course, as we um, can imagine, uh, it was a huge uh, danger to, to you also to the uh, people who were filmed in this, um, in this situation. Um, so I was wondering whether you consider this production to be the most dangerous uh, thing, you, the, the most dangerous projects you have ever um, done. Um, or compared to your previous work, uh, you have you faced such a, such a similar um, problems and, and difficulties. You know, I have a long career in print journalism, um, a shorter career in documentary filmmaking. Um, uh, in my print work, I have done um, reporting from dangerous parts of the world. I've done war reporting and hotspot reporting. I've reported with rebels and guerrilla uh, armies, um, but nowhere before have I uh, been engaged in um, information gathering 
where the gathering itself had a potential to um, to cause uh, so much more harm to people. Um, so uh, you're right to assume that this was a new experience for me. Um, and it was a very hard ask for me um, and a, a difficult conversations that uh, that I had with everybody who's in the film, you know, how can we do this? Um, can it can it be done at all? Should it be done? Um, uh, and the the answer to the should it be done question was that the activists desperately needed um, a record of the work that they were doing for the world to see, for the world to know what's going on there, and that um, that these ordinary human beings, um, you know, uh, are called upon because no one else is doing anything to take on these risks and and they were doing it with incredible bravery but but also knowing that their their lives will never be the same um, that's why we did it but in each instance we asked ourselves how can we do this safely can this be done what happens at each possible uh, intercession by uh, government forces uh, what will we do? What will we say? What do we carry in our pockets in case we are caught? Um, what are, wh where are we putting um, footage as it comes off of cars, um, even in the airports? How are we um, guaranteeing that that footage not be intercepted um, before we get a chance to transfer the video images onto encrypted drives? Um, how do we protect those encrypted drives? All of those questions were um, were the subject of lengthy planning and analysis and uh, security protocol development uh, beforehand. Um, yes, you, you've mentioned uh, those um, hesitations that you had and um, um, the ideas you took to to provide uh, some sort of safety to these people, um, and you actually used or created a very um, innovative um, modern technology to um, to hide the identity uh, of the protagonist. Could you perhaps elaborate on this a bit? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I was surprised by when I first started working on this uh, reporting was that the people who are escaping um, this campaign in the Chechen Republic, um, they're, that they're not safe anywhere in Russia, uh, that the Russian authorities would remove, would return them to Chechnya for, um, for the political leadership there to continue conducting this genocide. Um, but that beyond that, even when they leave the, the borders of Russia and uh, find themselves in places uh, of Western liberties for the LGBTQ community, um, they're being hunted. This is a campaign that's been described as a blood cleansing by the leader in Chechnya. And so it's not enough to scare people away. Uh, the diabolical concept is that, that all LGBTQ Chechens must be discovered, must be rounded up, must be liquidated. Um, a campaign, we haven't seen anything like this kind of campaign since, since Hitler. And um, so when I was asking the subjects to let me film them, uh, I was, uh, they they were very clear to me that they their faces could never be shown, uh, that they will um, that they will never be safe, and um, and so I promised them and I would try and find some way to both um, guard their anonymity, but also um, platform their humanity, and um, uh, and that's when. Uh, you know, I got back to New York with the footage I had shot over an 18-month period and, um, and had to try and find a way to live up to that promise. And the solution we came up with was one that had never been done before uh, that involved using artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning to actually digitally place someone else's skin over their faces um, to, uh, to allow in public um, what they said and did uh, as I was watching them to allow them to reclaim their own narratives, reclaim their humanity really, um, while being protectively shielded under um, somebody else's face. It's a, a, a brand new use of a technology um, 
and uh, and it was deployed to protect 23 people in the film. Um, so, uh, uh, and I think uh, effectively. I mean, I, I know effectively. I I worked with each of those people um, uh, that I could find and reach out to to get their approvals for the the approach and for their security reviews for them just tell me uh, that they're comfortable knowing that i had done what we had discussed and what we had promised together that we would do yes from uh, from a perspective of the viewer i think that the result is uh, is really impressive uh, and, and amazing so you, you did a really um great job uh, but nevertheless, um, did you um, did you face situations when, on the very beginning, when you were starting shooting there, the, the people, uh, because w you just mentioned that such an atrocity hasn't been happening in the world since since Hitler. So uh, we can imagine that, that these people who were frightened and um, and endangered, extremely endangered. They could be reluctant to to participate in the in such a such an initiative, even uh, despite the, all those um, techniques and tools done to to protect their identity. So I was wondering whether um, did you did you actually face the difficulty to um, to convince uh, these people to to take part, or perhaps they were willing to to do it. For the sake of, as you, as you mentioned, um, telling the story to, to the world. Well, the people who are in the film readily agreed. Um, they they understood the uh, the the need to expose what was happening there. They understood and uh, and really hungered for the 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 power of um, of of reclaiming their narratives. As I said before. Uh, and they um, were eager to work with me um, to find a way to be able to do that. They, the people who are in the film, keenly believe that uh, that what happened to them needs to be uh, redressed uh, politically uh, and uh, judicially, and um, and and in 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 the courts, um, uh, both in Russia and outside of Russia. Uh, there are many people, as you rightly surmise, who were not comfortable with doing that, who may have wanted to tell their stories, uh, but did not feel that they could, given everything that they'd already been through, take the risk. Um, and the risks of them arriving, for example, um, in uh, Berlin um, uh, uh, are that the the vast Chechen diaspora around the globe um, is being called upon to find the people where they land and to uh, find ways to get them back to Chechnya to continue this campaign. Um, so they, they literally need to be so deeply underground that, um, that some just didn't see in that balance between personal safety and the, the desire to expose. Um, they didn't they didn't feel comfortable crossing that line, and I certainly honored that with them. Uh, in in the uh, the shelter scenes, um, you see a small number of the people who are in the shelter, uh, and the larger number uh, were uh, uh, stayed away from the the, len my, the lenses of my cameras. Interesting, though, we did leave cameras behind, and many of the people who did not want to be filmed, nonetheless, used those cameras to record their own stories, either just through audio or by pointing the camera at their shoes as they told their stories, there was a, there was a, a need to expose. There was a, a need to um, say what happened to them, um, that e even the people who were the most concerned about um, their own personal securities found ways to advance. It's an interesting thing that you mentioned about people um, taking the cameras that you left, because actually I was going to ask about this, um, because I think we, we can understand this as a, some sort of a way to allow uh, these people to become um, some sort of narrators themselves uh, of the story. So um, by doing it, you exactly you allowed them to to share with the audience what they wanted to uh, to tell, what they wanted to um, to show, and I think Mr. it's an, um, an amazing way of uh, allowing people to bring their perspective in, in a first-person perspective. Um, 
was it in the uh, or on the on the moment of of, of um, editing and I think was it uh, was it difficult for you to somehow combine everything together to keep the um, keep the flow and also to keep the, the the you know your main narrative and the narrative created by the other people it was as I said I filmed for 18 months uh, and um, and I I followed in a very detailed way um, many other people's stories who were eager to be in the film. And unfortunately, I couldn't put all of those stories in the film. That was very difficult. Um, how to find um, the, the specific narratives and the specific rhythm of, a, of, of cinema to tell this story that is so, so urgent and, uh, uh, and necessary. And that was the trade-off that's a, a, always a very difficult one. Um, the, there are people whose stories are just as powerful and just as moving, and, and people who I loved just uh, in, this, um, in the same way that I came to, to love all the people that you do see in the film. And it was a heartbreak for me to first to, to remove their stories from the film, and then secondly to tell them that I had had to do that. Uh, yet I was able to share with them the, the, the scenes that I had shot and, and cut that involved them so that they could see what I saw and, uh, and to let them know that this footage is available for them uh, should they ever uh, find a use for it or request it from me. Yes, it's been a very difficult, um, difficult work for you. Um, well, it's, it's, you just mentioned you've been working on it for 18 months, um, and I was also um, curious. Did you? I'm sure you you've witnessed some um, ethical hesitations or hesitation on ethical ground. Um, for example, were there moments uh, when you were staying with, in the shelter or in different places with these people where you decided not to shoot um, certain um, certain things because they were just, you know, in your opinion, maybe not, not entirely ethical, or perhaps you did shoot something, but eventually decided decided to decide not to um, use it in the film for uh, for because of what was uh, what was there. Well, there, you know, we, sh we shot everything that um, that our partners on the ground um, agreed to let us shoot. Um, and some of what we found on the, in the footage when we came back was, uh, perhaps more revealing than, um, than anyone had anticipated. There were, there was, for example, a scene that was shot of, uh, uh, of the activists and, um, survivors arriving at one of the embassies and going to a back door at the embassy to work out a private, um, uh, Kind of less than um, uh, usual arrangement for uh, an emergency visa to get somebody into that third country. Um, we shot that and decided not to use that in the end because it revealed um, too much about the way certain governments were responding, certain people within certain governments, and we did not want to um, uh, bring anybody um, any sort of political harm um, but uh, the the ethics, otherwise, of what we were shooting were exclusively about exposing the horrors of this genocide, and um, and so ethically, I felt the obligation to keep filming, to keep documenting, um, to get as much of that as we possibly could. I mentioned that we did um, security reviews with each of the people who were in the film, uh, and uh, after having replace their faces with these face doubles. Um, we learned that there were additional issues that, that needed to be addressed in the footage. For example, was that person's ring uh, unique enough that it might be identifiable? You know, could her relatives find her through that ring? Could um, uh, articles of clothing um, be uh, somehow a telltale, um, ev uh, you know, uh, signals to people that who the individuals were, um, things that we had not anticipated. But then we returned to our uh, video effects supervisor and began to do what is more traditional VFX work, um, removing a ring, um, changing hair color, um, uh, changing uh, a person's shirt or uh, 
removing a person's bag, that kind of work that is all about kind of deletion of, of, of information and, um, uh, and that we might not have known about had we not been working so closely with the people uh, in partnership with the people who are survivors and who are, um, uh, who had agreed to, to work with us to tell their own stories. Thank you. Um, since, uh, but, uh, again, uh, I will repeat, um, you mentioned about filming it for 18 months. Um, there's been a lot of, um, going on, on this, uh, on this topic throughout the, these actually over three years altogether. Um, some of the cases were brought to, to the court. Um, I know that you, you were following some of, um, uh, of the events that were happening and updating them on, on your website, I mean, on the website of the film. Um, I, w I was wondering whether you are still in touch with some of the protagonists to, you know, to, to, to follow what, uh, what was happening to them later on. Perhaps uh, are you planning any any sort of a follow up to uh, to this film? Oh, that, that's interesting. I I have been um, in very close uh, contact with the folks who are in the film. The film is rolling out uh, across the globe, um, and we want to make sure that um, every uh, time it it gets a festival launch uh, or festival play. Uh, or commercial distribution that people on the ground in those countries are anticipating um, this new attention and that they're in places of comfort and safety. So um, that is still an ongoing uh, challenge for us. And, um, uh, and um, well, one of the places we're coming out commercially, of course, is in Poland. We are appearing in Poland next month with HBO Europe um, commercially. Uh, distributing the film there, um, uh, but as far as um, sequels or follow-ups, uh, nothing planned right now. I have not been continuing to film with anybody, but uh, have been very closely um, in communication with them, uh, with as many people as I can possibly be reached, some of them through third parties because they have gone so deeply into the shadows that, uh, that they have created a um, Kind of a protective barrier around themselves of, um, uh, of, of of friends and activists to make sure that um, that their identities and their locations uh, remain as secret as possible. So, um, should additional things happen, should you know, here's what I would love to do. I would love to do the film about how suddenly the world leaders have risen up against uh, what's happening in Chechnya and have done something to stop it and done something to bring justice there. And I would love the film, this new film, this imagined new film that you're getting me to think about, uh, to talk about how what's happening in Chechnya is really the tip of a vast iceberg. You, you started out by talking about the, the issue in, in Poland where the, the, the gay free zones are spreading and where uh, anti-queer hostilities are, are, are uh, mounting. And that's happening everywhere. It's, we, we have entered a period of regression around um, the acceptance of queer lives and the acceptance of queer love. And in a way, we're, we are all heading into Chechnya and we, we, we have to do something about it or um, Chechnya will describe the, the world as we know um, in the future. And, uh, and hopefully activism will continue around this Hopefully, uh, government leaders will take leadership and and uh, and begin to counter this trend. Yes, well, I guess what, all we need for the next part is just to have those world leaders react. <laughs> uh, but of course, it's uh, this is a, not an easy um, task. Um, um, for the end, I would like to talk to you about the with yes the the more universal um, aspect of the film because uh, as i understand uh, one of the main um, reasons behind it apart from highlighting on what was what was and is unfortunately still happening in chechnya was to um, to raise awareness of the you've mentioned it already raise awareness of the problems facing by the lgbtq plus communities in different parts of the of the world 
Um, and as you mentioned in Poland, uh, one of the current burning issues are those uh, gay-free, LGBT-free um, zones um, declared by the municipalities of different towns. Um, and the advocacy plus the activism could be a, so, um, a solution. Um, um, and do you, do you think that, um, oh, what do you think could, um, could work better now with, with this thing presented in, uh, in different countries, uh, with different continents, and how could it uh, motivate or raise awareness in, in those places to, um, to have people react and the authorities uh, react uh, on, this, uh, on these problems? Well, I, too many parts of the world, um, news about um, the, the horrors in Chechnya have been, has been suppressed or limited, um, uh, either because of censorship or because of media dereliction, which I think has been what's happening in the United States around this subject. Um, uh, this uh, allows Putin and Kadyrov in Chechnya to deny the, uh, the, the, that anything is happening there, to say that there's no evidence of it. And um, what I hope people will, will see in the film is uh, absolute incontrovertible evidence of the crimes that Kadyrov and his people are committing and will be witness to the things that they say there are no witnesses for. Um, uh, we need to let the world know that we know what's going on there and that we can disseminate this information and share this information among ourselves in a powerful way. Uh, the film also shows us, I think, the power of activism, that, that it is possible to, um, to take on this insurmountable, this, uh, this apparently insurmountable uh, 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 issue and begin to make a difference, that we can find it within ourselves to do something of that a magnitude, of that kind of heroic proportion. Um, and one of the things that we can do is to begin to put pressure on our governmental leaders and say, you must do something about this. We cannot let this go on. Um, it's, uh, it, it must be addressed. Kadyrov must be stopped. Putin must be uh, forced to uh, to end what the, the crimes that are happening there and to open up the, the courts to within Russia to um, to criminal cases that are uh, that have been brought against the those who did the abduction and torture and killing there um, and Europe itself can put pressure on Russia to do that the UN can put pressure on Russia to do that the United States which had been silent about uh, the reports as they when they first came out in 2017, when they came out again in 2018 and 2019, um, and it wasn't until um, uh, Welcome to Chechnya was screened for uh, Congress this summer that the U.S. State Department, three years after the first news broke, uh, finally issued the sanctions against Kadyrov and the leadership there specifically for the campaigns of cruelty and horror that are being committed against LGBTQ Chechens. And, um, and that's what I hope the film will do. That's what I know that we are capable as individuals of being able to produce to, to, to really collectivize our voices and demand, demand um, action to end this humanitarian crisis. Yes, um, I think that these tangible um, examples of, or examples of tangible results that you provided are the great proof of the um, um, effectiveness of such an activism combined with uh, filmmaking. So, um, and I also hope that well, what I what I see in in this film is uh, even in such a such terrible and hostile environment, it it. it provides a hope that even this uh, worst possible um, situation, there are still ways of, of doing something, of, of making a difference. And it should, it shows um, the other people and the other completely different um, countries, the, there's still a lot uh, to, be, to be done. And I hope it, it continues to do it uh, this way. Thank you again for joining us, David, and sharing with um, us uh, the insights of um, this production and hope to, to see it uh, in many more festivals, um, streaming platforms and everywhere.
Thank you. Well, thank you, Casper. I really appreciate it. And thanks for doing this and, and helping to get more witnesses to this, to, to this ongoing problem.